Hello everyone and welcome to Wednesday Warfare, where I review NXT and AEW Dynamite back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. We begin right away with NXT. Killian Dane opens the show, pacing around the ring. He's supposed to wrestle Damian Priest, but he is out with a rib injury, so he makes an open challenge to anyone. Pete Dunne answers the call, so they has match. It's a strong way to open the show, very physical match with these guys. Very creative and frankly painful way to end the match, where uh, Dunne is on top of Dane's back in the rear chin lock and uh, very similar to what happened at TakeOver in the Triple Threat match, Dane just falls onto his back and crushes Dunn, but they're doing it from the second turnbuckle at this point now, not just from the ground, so it looks especially painful for Dunn to get crushed there, and by virtue of just being on top of him, Dane pins Dunn for the victory. It's probably one of the more interesting ways Dunn has lost a match in NXT since he's been signed, uh, but there you go, that's the opener. Dane uh, actually gets the upset on Pete Dunn in kind of an interesting way. We see a backstage interview with Dakota Kai. She says that Tegan Knox is not worth her time anymore, and she can't wait to put a hurting on Rhea Ripley the same way she did to that hood rat, in her words, Mia Yim. Them's fighting words. The Undisputed Air show up, minus Bobby Fish. Apparently, he's hurt himself once again. He's out with a neck injury for the time being, so it's the other three members right now. Adam Cole is mad that Keith Lee, in the last episode, pounced him in the next week, and that Finn Balor kicked him in the head uh, at the end of the show after the match with Tommaso Ciampa. He calls out Balor, but Keith Lee shows up instead, and then uh, Kyle O'Reilly with his joke. It's like, hey everyone, look, it's Keith Momentara Lee, because he's like the moment maker. Like, oh, that was a really bad joke. Keith tells Adam that he should be thankful that he made him one of the most viral gifts of the last week, and he wonders which of those belts should he challenge for first. Uh, the Era start beating up Lee, then out comes Tommaso Ciampa to try and help even the odds. Uh, the Undisputed Era run off, and we'll be having a six-man tag team match uh, between these guys later in the night. The only question is, who will Ciampa and Lee's third man be? We get a nice little video package for Kushida, getting ready for his entering return after breaking his wrist two months ago against Walter. Nice footage here of him playing with his family. He talks about how much of a family man he is and how he fights for the betterment of his family. It was a really good video here showing the more of a human side to Kushida as he gets ready for his return. We then go to a match between Zia Lee and Shayna Baszler, non-title action. Last week, Baszler and her buddies beat up Zia Lee after her match with uh, Vanessa Bourne, so getting, trying to get some revenge here. Zia does get a couple of moments to shine, but ultimately, Shayna wins pretty handily with a Kirifuda clutch. Cassius Ono's back at NXT USA for the first time in several weeks. He calls himself a wrestling genius and the greatest British wrestler alive, and he wants to bring a preview of Worlds Collide to NXT tonight. I hope it's the round system. I feel really good about the round system. The Forgotten Sons taking on Leon Ruff and Adrian Alanis from Evolve in tag team action. It's a squash match. The Sons win pretty handily. Then afterwards, just for good measure, Jackson Riker chokeslams Ruff onto the apron on the outside, so he falls out. Pretty nasty bump. It's the best the Forgotten Sons have looked in weeks. Dakota Kai is scheduled to take on Rhea Ripley in singles action. I love that Dakota's entrance video is just her footage of her beating up Tegan Knox at War Games in black and white. That's just a great, great heel heat right there. Uh, Rhea comes out and says, you know, you set us up at War Games, so we got a setup of our own. It's Mia Yim. She comes out and starts beating the hell out of Dakota, chases her off. They escape the arena while they're fighting. Then out comes Shayna Baszler and her friends, Justin Duke and Marina Shafir. The three of them beat down Rhea and like the uh, the two goons hold down Rhea's arms while uh, Shayna's got the Kirifuda clutch locked onto Rhea. It's really powerful stuff. And then Shayna says, you know, in two weeks they are going to have a championship match. So December 18th, that is the show that both AEW and NXT are heavily building toward based on what we see in tonight's programming. That should be a really good match. This segment was really good because it makes Shayna look like just absolute uh, killer and also makes Rhea look strong because it took three women to take her down. Backstage we see Tommaso Ciampa and Keith Lee being interviewed. Who's the third man going to be in their six-man tag. Why? It's Dominic Dijakovic. And then we see a couple of hype packages. One for Finn Balor where he tells Adam Cole he's coming for his championship. And then another hype package for Isaiah Swerve Scott. Cassius Ono making his way to the ring. Like I mentioned, the first time he's been on NXT regular in several weeks, having a stint in NXT UK. And he finds an old rival in Matt Riddle answering his open challenge. And this is just a great match. These guys have a lot of history together. Uh, just a great combination of the striking and the technical prowess between the both of them. Ultimately, Riddle wins with the bro Derek, and so uh, Matt Riddle continues his unbeaten streak against Cassius Sono, but great match nonetheless.
Kushida versus Raul Mendoza will not be seen tonight as Cameron Grimes appears and jumps Raul during his entrance. So we get Cameron Grimes versus Kushida instead. It's a relatively short match, but it's solid. Uh, Kushida wins a very competitive matchup with a roll up. You know, it's a good return for Kushida. He looks great here, though I question why they had to sacrifice Cameron for this one because I feel they've been doing a pretty good job trying to protect him over the last couple of months. So for him to be a last minute replacement in this matchup, even though he looked okay in the matchup, he still lost. It just seemed kind of a weird thing to have him be the one to be sacrificed for Kushida's return. We get a nice little recap of the Leo Rush Angel Garza feud, and they announced they're going to be having a cruiserweight championship match in two weeks. Then in our main event, we have the Undisputed Era taking on Keith Lee, Dominic Dijakovic, and Tommaso Ciampa in a six man tag match. Kind of got a little PWG reunion. It's basically the War Games match, only not, and with fewer people. The match ends when Finn Balor shows up to dropkick Adam Cole, and in doing so, we get a referee bump, people go down. Keith Lee shows up and puts the spirit bomb on Finn Balor, then a jackhammer to Cole to win the match for his team. Then after the matchup, William Regal shows up and says, okay, in two weeks' time, Adam Cole's defending the NXT Championship against the winner of next week's triple threat match between Tommaso Ciampa, Finn Balor, and Keith Lee. So that should be a great matchup, and it really seems at this point they're really strapping the rocket to Keith Lee. In the words of Cultaholic, don't you forget about Keith. AEW opens up with a six-man tag match as the Young Bucks and Dustin Rhodes, who's wearing some Bucks-inspired attire tonight, taking on the inner circle, Sammy Guevara and Proud and Powerful. There are some audio issues throughout the bulk of this match, which do improve by the end, by, by, as the broadcast goes on. But this first match, kind of distracting in the audio issues. It's a fast-paced, frenetic matchup. Dustin even takes the air more than one occasion during the whole thing. The match ends when Sammy's trying to vlog a shooting star press from the top, but he gets intercepted by two super kicks from the Bucks. Then a really interesting like double tombstone drop kick senton splash <laughs> it was a really impressive looking spot here the young bucks and dustin Rhodes win a uh, good way to open the show Trent Beretta taking on ray phoenix here i loved this match this is one of my favorites of the night uh, both guys looked great here some awesome athleticism on display uh great call by shivani in the matchup here there's a near fall and shivani goes we all thought it was over even orange cassidy he moved a little bit ultimately phoenix wins with his spinning muscle buster but yeah great look for both these guys here. And of course, Ray Phoenix just continues to blow me away every week. Cody is in the ring now to discuss some of his more recent drawbacks in AEW. He talks about the Butcher and the Blade and the Bunny and even brings up their past in Beyond Wrestling and Bar Wrestling. Nice little name drops there. He then turns his attention to MJF who calls him, he, he refers to him as a Bush League NWO Chris Jericho. Says his scarf is probably fake. He says he's the worst looking crossroads in history. At least they're botching it on two channels now, Cody says. And he wonders what will it take for MJF to wrestle Cody? Will it be his car, his watch, his shoes, a briefcase full of cash? He even gives a $100 bill to like this kid in the front row who looks absolutely thrilled about it. And so that's pretty much where it ends. He just basically, he drops the, he throws, he lays on the gauntlet, so to speak, for MJF. So strong promo by Cody here, a little bit of uh, humor thrown in there as well. Really curious to see what MJF will do to react to it. Then we see Alex Marvez interviewing Joey Janela backstage. He cuts a promo on John Moxley, who is wrestling in the main event tonight. Moxley shows up in the shot, they have a stare down, and then Moxley just looks at the camera, shrugs his shoulders, and goes, ah, kids, and then he walks off, which I'm like, mm, I don't know how to feel about that, because it kind of takes the piss out of Janela and the fiery promo he just had before he was interrupted. Uh, kind of, obviously, he's discounting him. We'll see how that plays into the match, though. We get another Dark Order vignette. Turns out they're recruiting incels from the looks of it. We then see the guy we've been following for the last few weeks at the subway station, and then the meeting last week. He looks like he doesn't really want to be there. He just wants to make some friends, which is why he wants to join the Dark Order. So then he gets mauled by the Creepers uh, for his troubles. And that's pretty much how it ends. It's been a very interesting thread they've been trying to weave here with the Dark Order vignettes. And I, I think that's done a, a better job to explain what the Dark Order is, even though it's still mysterious, than the whole first few months of their existence in AEW. Nyla Rose is back on Dynamite to take on Leva Bates. I'm pretty sure it's her first time on Dynamite since losing to Riho in the women's title match in the very first episode. Uh, they show a recap of what happened last week when Nyla beat up Shannon at an autograph signing, and Jimmy Havoc just stood there not doing a damn thing about it. Uh, Nyla destroys um, Leva Bates and Peter Avalon in pretty short order, and then as the commercial break is about to happen, Shanna shows up, Nyla cuts her off, beats her down, and Nyla grabs a table during the commercial break, power bombs the referee through the table, and then power bombs Shanna onto the referee in his prone body. And after that, we cut to a shot of Britt Baker in the crowd, sitting there looking concerned. It's like a blatant parody of the end of War Game when after the 
air raid crash, we cut to a shot of Britt Baker, who is Adam Cole's girlfriend, and so she's there in the crowd. And like, did you really need? Did you feel the need to like really copy that shot? And not to mention, if you're comparing like big spot to big spot, Nyla Rose powerbombing Shanna onto a referee who's on a table is not nearly the same amount of impact as uh, Champa doing the air raid crash from the top of the cage to get Adam Cole through two tables. They are not comparable in any way whatsoever. So it's just kind of weird they brought Britt Baker out to do just that. Like it's a little kind of wink, get it? It's, you know, it's a whole poking the bear thing, going after NXT by name and doing these blatant things. You know, don't really know how I feel about that, but I lean on the side of don't do it. It's one of my Wednesday night highlights, Chris Jericho promo time. He talks about how they've already sold 12,000 bottles of a little bit of the bubbly in the first week. Uh, two of those are mine, by the way. I'll be doing a taste test when I get them in a couple weeks. Anyway, he says he needs an opponent for his uh, last match of the year on December 18th. So he's put together a little list, he says, which is a big pop from the crowd. He shuts them down since it's now called the Lexicon of the Champion. Brilliant. So it's a list of people he will not be facing in two weeks. Moxley is chief among them. His name shows up the most. There's a lot of like, kind of joke names in there as well. Finally, the Jurassic Express show up, and then Jericho says, oh, dinosaurs and small children, also on my list of people I'm not wrestling. So then uh, Luchasaurus cuts a bit of a promo, and then they basically defer to Jungle Boy as the person who wants to fight Jericho. And uh, Jericho calls him a, a mute and a piece of shit, saying, you know, you wouldn't last 10 minutes with me. Jungle Boy grabs the microphone and says, I would last 10 minutes, and I'll kick your ass. So they has fight. Jericho and Jake Hager run off. And that's the, the match is now set. Jericho and Jungle Boy for two weeks. You know, I think it's going to be great. I love Jungle Boy. I've worked with him. He's an amazing guy, and he's a great talent and great in the ring. I love this opportunity he's getting, but deep down, there's a part of me that wanted Luchasaurus to get the nod. I'm just saying. Chris Statlander challenging her tag team partner from last week, Hikaru Shida, in singles action this week, and this was a really good match. And the biggest shock of all was Statlander beating Shida with her finisher, the Big Bang, cleaning the ring, and so she pins the number one contender in a huge upset. Really cool to see. Right after that, though, the lights cut out, and then we see uh, Awesome Kong and Brandy Rose on the stage. Brandy calls herself and Kong the Nightmare Collective, and she says they do the jobs no one else wants to do, and nobody speaks of it, like cutting women's hair. So she offers Chris an opportunity to pledge her allegiance to the Collective. We get a stare down between Chris and Awesome Kong. Suddenly, we hear a voice from the crowd, and we see this woman in the front row who very, uh, uh, very excitedly wants to pledge her allegiance to the Collective. She gets there on the apron, and she gets on her knees, and they start cutting her hair. She Shaving her bald. And the whole thing just reeked of Serena Deeb joining the Straight Edge Society many, many years ago. And the whole thing just like, I didn't like this thing at all. You know, of all the many things people will criticize AEW for being inauthentic, Brandy Rose's current gimmick is the least authentic of all. Like, we've seen how Brandy is for several years. Her character is, is almost a, is a fixed plane right now. So she's doing this whole dark thing, and it doesn't really fit her. I don't know what they're, I, I was, I've been trying to give them the benefit of the doubt and seeing where it goes with this. And the whole thing, Thing, the whole promo where she explained it tonight, just I didn't really care for it. I feel that do we really need two cults on one show? Do we need three creepy gimmicks on one show between the Nightmare Collective, the Butcher, the Blade, and the Bunny, and the Dark Order? Do we need that much creepiness and like, ooh, black and white, gritty vibe thing going? That, to me, I think is a little excessive. Um, at least the one thing I will say, though, the silver lining here, I think Chris Statlander are looking great in this whole segment. Not only beating the number one contender clean in the ring, but also standing up to Awesome Kong before anything happened. But the fact she's standing up to her, I think it was really strong for her as well. But yeah, this whole Nightmare Collective the pledging thing. Uh, by the way, the woman who got her head shaved, her name was Melanie Cruz. She's also known as Raven's Ash in Shimmer, so good for her. Just a weird segment. Christopher Daniels makes his interim return against the man who put him on the shelf with a package pile driver several weeks ago, Pentagon Jr. It's a pretty good match here. There's a scary moment at one point where Daniels goes for an Arabian moonsault onto the ramp on the outside, but he totally eats shit. And so Excalibur, though, to his credit, covers for it pretty well, saying so maybe it's the still ling the, the lingering effect to the pinched nerve he suffered at the hands of Pentagon. It's a pretty good cover there. Ultimately, Ray Phoenix comes in and brings the mic stand into the equation. Uh, Daniels decides to not use it, but in the distraction by the referee, Big Dick Kick City by Pentagon. Another package pile driver and Pentagon wins. So the Lucha Brothers are 2-0 in singles action on the night. I think it's like really cool they are utilizing 
Pentagon and Ray Phoenix in singles capacity as well as tag team stuff. They're not just shoehorning them into the tag team scene and keeping them exclusive. I like they can kind of go back and forth. And that's another thing I want to say. The difference between, you know, AEW and like WWE is when a tag team is like when one person suspended or injured, both guys are off TV for a long time. You don't have the other one used in a singles capacity. So far in the last just couple weeks alone, we've seen like tag team wrestlers being used in singles action and it doesn't feel like, oh my God, what a what a rarity this is. Like, except for maybe for Nick Jackson uh, last week. But still, besides that, I think they're like, they're utilizing tag teams, but they're also letting them work singles too, which I think is a big plus. We get a pretty short promo by The Butcher, The Blade, and The Bunny. Allie uh, explains the reason they beat up Cody last week was they were sick of seeing his face everywhere and they want to cut the head off the snake. Main event time as John Moxley takes on Joey Janela. This match is not at all on the same level of what they did at Fighter Fest several months ago. Still a damn good match nonetheless. Janela does look good here. C tries to kind of like earn back some of like the uh, the esteem that he lost when Moxley just kind of went kids earlier in the night. Moxley eventually wins the match with a pair of paradigm shifts. One off the uh, top turnbuckle and another one in the ring. So Moxley wins and then we get kind of a tit for tat moment from last week where last week the show ended with Moxley standing in the crowd staring down Chris Jericho. This week it was the inverse. You had Jericho and his friends at the inner circle standing in the crowd staring down at Moxley as we fade to black still building that matchup for sometime in the future, probably Bash the Beach. Time now for me to decide which show won for the week, NXT or AEW Dynamite. This week, my pick is going to be Dynamite. I think this show was the perfect blend of wrestling action and world and character building. I think the wrestling was fun. I had a lot more fun watching those matches than I did watching NXT, which was still good uh, for, in terms of in-ring quality. I think I had more fun and had more reaction to watching those matches. And I think the promos were all great all around, except for Brandy Rhodes. But besides that, I think it was a really strong episode. Uh, like NXT, AEW is building toward December 18th, and I think the way they're building to it at the same time is really interesting. I'm really curious to see how that particular episode is going to go down in two weeks. But we, of course, we have one more week to go before that, so we'll just have to see how it plays out. But let me know what you thought about AEW and NXT in the comments section below, and vote which show you thought was better by going to the iCard in the corner of your screen. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.